fit, uh, which is very much needed, by the way. Uh, but you know, a slowing down in China is not is not a collapse, right? So, you know, so last year we grew at six point six percent. This year, perhaps you know something around six percent, let's say, and six percent is not uh, uh, you know very slow uh, pace. Now, um, the Chinese macro policies are, uh, are very. Um, uh, data dependent, I put it this way. Uh, so at, at this point, the government has, has already uh, readied uh, uh, quite that strong of uh, fiscal policy as well as monetary policy. But uh, you know, if things continue to, uh, to be challenging going forward, uh, on the fiscal side, there's a lot room to expand. Uh, some people worry about you know, the overall debt in China. Uh, I think that to the corporate sector is a little bit too high, but the government sector can still leverage uh, a lot. Uh, and you're already seeing the local governments uh, issuing more uh, what we call project bond. Uh, the central government hasn't done so. Uh, the ability for the central government to uh, borrow more is also uh, very, very large. Uh, so uh, the bottom line is that you know, China is slowing down, but uh, it's not going to be a disaster. So. What, what areas would you say are seeing the most slowdown? I mean, because you make mm. such an important point. It was the slowest pace of growth in three decades, in 2018, and yet any country on the globe would love to say it is growing 6%. So can you identify the specific industries that you believe are actually leading that slowdown? Well, export is, you know, one uh, example. Uh, the data from December uh, for exports uh, was not very encouraging. Uh, and we will see. I mean, it, maybe it's a uh, response to, you know, to the trade dispute with the United States. It could be also an indication of a global slowing down. Uh, and we will see how this will unfold. On the consumption side, last year actually did quite well. But then I mentioned uh, you know, the real estate market because housing prices are perhaps too high, and that squeezed a lot of money out of households, um, you know, squeezed consumptions, right? So we need to do a lot about housing. Um, and uh, uh, infrastructure is another area, because a lot of infrastructures were uh, done in China by local governments. Uh, and during the last few years, you know, China has tightened up the implicit debt that local governments could borrow. Uh, but we've expanded the explicit debt that the local government can borrow. Uh, so there's a room there. Uh, we will see how, how the slowdown of infrastructure spending uh, is dealt with this year. But again, you know, the Chinese macro policy is very, um, I would say, is very responsive and also is data dependent. So as things unfold, we will respond uh, accordingly. And the capacity for the Chinese government to respond to economic slowdown is still very high. Uh, if anything, you know, we uh, should not overreact. Ray Dalio, you have to allocate capital regardless of the environment as the backdrop. And you've been doing that for years very effectively. In fact, even just in 2018, you were up almost 15% in the face of all of what we are talking about, increasing debt levels, global slowdown, and so many other things. Tell us how you see the backdrop and how you do allocate capital in this environment. Well, um Let's say the backdrop. Um, uh, maybe I start with a template. Uh, I think over a period of time, there's productivity, and the growth rate of productivity is the most important thing. You learn more, you invent more, you become more efficient, and that rises. Then we have cycles around that. We have a normal business cycle, short-term debt cycle, and then there is a longer-term debt cycle, which has to do with the capacity of leveraging up being limited when you approach zero interest rates or limitations in terms of the effectiveness of quantitative easing. So that framework is what I use when I'm looking at China, when I'm looking at any country. Um, I think we make a uh, bigger picture. I think we are in the later stages of the short-term debt cycle. Um, meaning maybe we're in the seventh or eighth inning of that and that there was um, an inappropriate mistaken desire to tighten monetary policy at a level that was faster than the capital markets could uh, handle. 
And as a result, we had a correction. We had 70 basis points change in rates. We had a, uh, an important change in Fed policy regarding the, what the direction of Fed policy will be in that tightening. But we're in the later stages of the cycle when asset prices are fully, were fully priced and still are somewhat fully priced. Um, I think uh, the key, key question, like when we look at each country, when we look at China, look at Europe, look at the United States, we will be in a s slowing economic environment. That growth rate will slow, um, and in a, probably in a self-reinforcing process. I think, it, uh, um, but the question really is whether monetary policy is denominated in one's own currency. These are all cycles. Uh, the cycle, in, like in China, yeah, they, I agree. It's, it's one of those cycles people pay attention to, but they have the power. The debt is in their currency. They can handle that, that cycle. But there is a weakening there. There is a, slow, a slowing, certainly a substandard growth rate in Europe and in the United States. There will be a significant okay. slowing in that particular period, which should warrant an easier monetary policy. The bigger issues, so these are the cycles, and then there's constraints of monetary policy for being able to deal with that. Then the bigger issues are really connected to politics and, um, and the economic policies associated with that. For example, when we um, uh, cut corporate taxes and we also made interest rates low enough that it was attractive to borrow to buy financial assets, uh, particularly by companies having mergers and acquisitions, that um, caused a lot of growth in corporate debt and that growth in corporate debt was used to finance those purchases which so supported the financial markets. So that is going to be less. So I, w I think that probably next year, um, the slow up and then the beginning of thinking about politics uh, and what that might affect economic policy beyond, something like the talk of the 70% income tax, for example, will play a greater role. So I think that that's, if, if I'm covering the world, U.S., um, and we live in a world economy, U.S., Europe, China, um, all of those will be experiencing a greater level of slowing, probably a greater level of disappointment. And I think there's, there's a reasonable chance that by the end of that, that the monetary policy and fiscal policy will be, have to become easier relative to what is now discounted in the markets. Yeah, you know, I think you make such an important point because for a decade, we had such low interest rates, zero, and, um, you know, such easy uh, monetary policy, not just in the United States, but across the world. As you see that being removed, it has to be disruptive, right? And I think at the end of the year, markets were reacting to the unwind of the Federal Reserve's balance sheet as much as the raising of interest rates. So I ask you, do we even have the wiggle room, if you will, in terms of cutting rates where they are? Uh, no, I think you could look at the level of interest rates and compare that to zero and think about that times the duration of the assets. And that is the power that you can have in having financial assets impacted by easing a monetary policy. Then you have to ask yourself, in terms of the balance sheets, how much can the balance sheets be increased? What would be purchased? And so on. So we, what scares me the most longer term is that we have limitations to monetary policy, which is our most valuable tool. We have important limitations to the effectiveness of that. At the same time as we have greater political and social antagonism. So what the next downturn in the economy uh, worries me the most. I think that there are a lot of parallels with the late 1930s. You know, 1929 to 32, we had uh, a debt crisis, interest rates hit zero. Then there was a lot of printing of money, purchases of financial assets, drives financial asset prices higher. Creates also a polarity, a populism, and an antagonism. We also had then at that time the phenomenon of a rising power like China um, dealing with the conflict of an existing power. These types of uh, political issues are now uh, very connected to economic issues and policy. So I think that um, that's the character of the environment we're in. Dr. Weber, you ran the Bundesbank for a time. Uh, I want to get your take on central bank policy as well. We also want to get into your assessment of China. In December, your firm announced you can, in fact, own a bank in China. 
You announced this in December, so we'll get back to that. But first, assess the story, as you heard uh, Ray discuss, in terms of central banks and the ability to react to a slowdown at this juncture. So Ray made the very important distinction between structure and business cycle, and I think that's important. Structurally, interest rates in most of the Western world, as we bounce back from the you know, financial crisis, were very low for very long, and markets have gotten used to that. I think actually rates for, uh, at least for the better half of the last five years, have been too low for the environment, for the economic environment we've been in. But of course, Ray mentioned the other point, that central banks waited very long time with keeping rates low because they were not gearing monetary policy towards the expected state of the economy and to the rebound of growth, but they were in a kind of insurance policy where they wanted to mitigate any tail risk and therefore kept rates longer just to eliminate tail risk to the economy. And of course, when they started lifting rates, they tightened rates in a late cycle stage. So the impact of that is that if you look at monetary policy easing, which is, uh, if you look at the room to maneuver, the only central bank that has any room to maneuver is actually the Federal Reserve. If you look at traditional policy moves by the Fed, they lower rate uh, very frequently at relatively large steps of 50 basis points. The Fed can do a number of interest rate steps down if need be. So I'm not worried about room to maneuver short term, but as Ray also said, Given that we've had so long rates for long, the market hasn't really priced in much higher rates. If anything, the Fed has come towards neutral. They're not quite at neutral, but they're close to it. And so going back down is an emergency measure they can take. But I think it's more likely, if you look at the year ahead, that they're on pause now. I think we're going through a soft spot in the economy. Uh, numbers have weakened, uh, both in emerging markets and in developed markets, over the uh, certainly the fourth quarter. We'll probably see a soft spot continuing into the first quarter of this year. And then after the middle of the year, we have some hope that, you know, that soft spot might be behind us. And that's not the point where monetary policy moves from tightening to easing. That's the point where monetary policy takes a pause, where they become data dependent, where they move into a wait and see attitude. I still have penciled in one or two rate hikes by the Fed over this year, but I think they'll take a pause now. They'll look at the data. And if and when they resume, in my view, it won't be before mid-year. And then I think the rest really much depends on how the current conflicts that we haven't yet talked about, the tail risks like the trade war and some of the other tail risks, Brexit, how that affects the global economy, what the spillback is back into the US, and how monetary policy should react to that in the United States. So I think central banks are on hold. The downside of central banks being on hold is the ECB will never even leave negative territory if they don't start raising rates this year. We still think there is some expectation that towards the end of the year they might do a 25, uh, 20 basis point rate hike. But the chances with the European data also coming in weaker, French data are, are looking weaker, German data are looking weaker, Eurozone doesn't look very strong. The expectation is still more, more likely to postpone that into next year. So I think in general, monetary policy normalization is not an issue for this cycle. It's for the next cycle. They won't get it done this time because the economy is weakening, and so I think it will be mission aborted. They will look at normalizing rates in the next cycle, and they react to a slowing economy over the next year or two by a more muted and a more cautious, more data-driven approach. Should the Fed slow down on the unwind? $50 billion a month is what the Fed had signaled uh, in terms of selling securities. I think the unwind is, is less of an issue in the United States uh, than it is in, in other constituencies because, you look, structurally, the Fed used to have a balance sheet that was around $750 billion. Long term, I don't think the Fed will go back to its old size of the balance sheet. The central bank's balance sheets will be a much more central part of financial markets, and they'd be a multiple of what we saw in central bank balance sheets then. I think that what the Fed needs to do is really look at uh, sort of, is that different role that central banks now have in the global economy, where markets are looking very much for uh, monetary policy as very often the only game in town. Is that the position central banks want to be in? Uh, our Chinese friends just said the right thing. Uh, if you look at macro policies, uh, monetary policy can react quickly because it's done by a, by a committee of elected bureaucrats. The real bigger impact you get from fiscal policy. It reacts slower, it needs to go through parliament, decision lags are longer, but it's much more impactful. 
And then the structural policies, don't forget the supply side. China is at the moment reacting with demand side measures, both easier monetary and fiscal policy, to cushion the economy against cooling. But the more important measures that China is taking is all the supply side reforms in opening market. That creates a lot of growth potential. That creates productivity enhancements. And so along with what Ray said, we're too focused on managing demand and managing sort of uh, you know, cyclical uh, movements. We should be a lot more focused on longer term structural issues and getting those right. Because I think the other stuff is very much a, 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 a distraction. You can spend time and money to cushion the economy against the downturn. But it's much better to enhance the growth potential of the economy so that the downturn doesn't really lead to such a big reset uh, every time it happens. And it happens uh, time and again. Yes, let, let's stay on this point for a moment in terms of China and the structural changes that we're seeing and the impact on the rest of the world. Kayu, your thoughts? Um, let us be reminded that only two years ago, China was, was considered to be a ticking financial bomb. So what we're seeing as a recent slowdown is simply a consequence of the government, um, a government's very successful effort to deleverage. So if we look at uh, the kind of deleveraging, uh, the different uh, sectors, financial sectors deleveraging has been quite successful. Most of the debt to assets have stabilized. Household debt is increasing, but household debt was very low and one can argue uh, too low for a while in China. So these efforts have made China financially much safer. And as a consequence, there will be a slowdown in economic growth. Part of it is, of course, um, uh, kind of triggered by external factors. But much of this is the deliberate effort of the government to slow down the credit growth, et cetera. Now, of course, uh, growth has now become more of an issue. The government is always treading between the line between financial risk and economic growth. And now they're shifting their uh, focus more on revamping uh, the growth. And they, as you know, Dr. Fong has mentioned, China has a whole set, the Chinese government has a whole set of tools that are not normally available uh, to other economies, uh, whether it's the massive uh, assets on the government balance sheet or the huge amount of saving uh, in China, or just simply coordination, coordination of different state-owned banks and state-owned um, you know, local governments. All of these things matter. That said, despite the fact that there are a lot of instruments to work with, I think China's main challenge is really how to unleash the real potential of the real economy. Uh, right now, monetary policy is expanding. You're injecting uh, more liquidity. You're uh, you know, pushing for proactive fiscal policy and reducing taxes. But the credit gets stuck in the financial sector. If it actually goes into the real economy, we are confident that there are real big forces of, of um, you know, positive changes for the Chinese economy, whether it's entrepreneurship, it's innovation, the fact that services are rising, service productivity is rising, urbanization. But the trouble is really the financial system and how to match uh, the investment and the savers and also give the household more ability to consume, right? If, you're, if the real interest rate on bank deposits, which you know, most of the saving is stuck, is earning zero in the last 10 years or 20 years while the economy is growing at you know, 6 to 8%, you are not giving that potential to the households and to the private sector. So it's all about unleashing the latent dynamism in the private sector. Do you think the opening up of markets, do you think this trade uh, issue with the United States will, in fact, impact the real economy in China? I think that trade war has come as a benefit in disguise because it is serving as the uh, external pressure for China to undertake some of these really important reforms. And as Excel has mentioned, financial services has uh, opened up or is really um, kind of on schedule to open up uh, vastly. Uh, consumers are now able to purchase many more goods from the US and from the rest of the world. China needs competition. So the financial sector needs competition. It needs to be injected with new blood. And it is such things uh, that will uh, help with that. So opening up in general, which is consistent with China's uh, longer term goals, is simply accelerated by the recent trade war. Dr. Fang, do you want yeah. to say something? Uh, yes, um, you know, Dr. Weber uh, had a very good point, and that is, as China right now seems to focus on you know, macro demand management, uh, the supply side uh, policy uh, 
has not been stopped. And we continue to push forward for supply side, what we call supply side structural reform. And I'll give you a few examples. You know, open up the financial sector for more international competition is one example. Doug Weber can say to that. Um, in the manufacturing sector, BASF, BASF, you know, recently was given uh, the opportunity to establish a 100% owned uh, massive uh, petrochemical uh, plant in China. It used to be a 50-50 JV requirement. Now this requirement is gone. Uh, China has reduced uh, input duty in a very substantial way, so there's more competition in the consumer market. So, um, you know, the supply side policy continued, and that's a very important point. Uh, and, you know, just to this audience, I want to say another word, that is that China's vision in the foreign economy is to make it open and large and competitive. So it's not only an opportunity uh, for the Chinese companies, but you know, it will also be a huge opportunity for all the companies from the world. Well, you, Ray, you've been in China for 30 years. You've been visiting there for 30 years. Axel, your firm just announced you now own a financial institution that you own 51% of, is that right? Yes, we were uh, the first bank that was offered a 51% stake uh, in a joint venture, and we've executed that in December, and uh, we now are the majority owner. We already had management control, and we're now free to increase that stake uh, further. Um, I think eventually, as we invest in China, uh, and since our major partners are the municipalities of Beijing and Shanghai, there's likely going to happen some dilution of our partners, and we're looking into ways of raising capital also locally. So there is some welcome discussion between you know, the Chinese authorities, not just with Hong Kong on the Shanghai-Hong Kong Bond Connect, but also there was an ongoing discussion with London. Uh, I know that uh, Dr. Fang is talking to the Swiss authorities. So the more we can connect stock markets, the more we can actually be super connectors as international financial institutions to bring international investors into the Chinese economy and to help Chinese investors invest in the rest of the world. And it's, it's absolutely right what, what our Chinese colleagues have said. The Chinese economy needs competition. And they're working, I think, on three legs of that. First is state-owned enterprise reform. And I think that is very important, and we've all gone through that in Europe in the 90s, of having former official sector conglomerates move to the private sector. The second one is competition between state-owned enterprises and private enterprises in China. And the third one is, and the authorities so far have been more cautious, opening up the Chinese economy for international competition, because that will really be a major contribution to increasing the competitiveness of companies. And of course, we as international experienced investors can help in that process uh, and actually can help both Chinese investors internationally and international investors in China. And just to give you an example, banks like UBS, we have a 24% share on the northbound traffic of the A-share market in the Hong Kong-Shanghai Stock Connect. So we're kind of the go-to bank for a quarter of the investors into mainland China internationally. Our market share in, for Chinese investors southbound is below 1%. We're not the go-to bank for international uh, investments for Chinese citizens. And as we're granted majority rights, as we're investing in our business, we just doubled our headcount in China over the last few years, we will become a major go-to partner also for Chinese investors in the global economy. But that will happen at a more measured pace because there is some concern in China that this will impact on the exchange rate. So the opening up process is more controlled but it's happening, you know. Don't mistake speed for direction. The direction is very clear. The speed, I think, has been uh, really uh, sort of uh, increased recently. I was just in China in the first week, and yeah. the constructive dialogues we had with Chinese authority is really on a totally different page today than it was a few years ago. So I'm very confident about this process. Let's, let's not forget, out of the top 20 banks in the world, the top five are Chinese. Ray. Well, you, you mentioned uh, I've been there 30 years and I've watched it evolve. And I think it, there are two types of things that are going on. Uh, let's call them the short term and the long term, right? I say, as I say, productivity is the big thing in the short, in the long term, and that's the real big thing. And then, the, then you have these short term debt cycles and you have these short term things. So the two things that are happening short term is that you're having a deleveraging that you just, uh, so articulately dealt with. There was an over-leveraging and, and there was a development of the financial markets. When I, um, not long ago, it was really 
five or six years ago. Five major banks loaned money to state-owned enterprises, and the money was clogged at the top. Then there was the development of the shadow banking system and the liberalization of that, and then the now put into place regulation. Whenever you're having a deleveraging, that is something that makes the country healthier because you're deleveraging, but it has a short-term effect, but it has a long-term positive. So there's the deleveraging happening. It's a short-term thing. And then there's the trade issues associated with that, which is also a short-term thing. But if you take productivity growth, if you take the approach, and I think it's, uh, it really has to be admired as you know, uh, Chinese characteristics, as it's described. You know, it's a certain top-down, it's a cultural challenge for the, for the West. But there's a top-down way of setting a mission for 2025 plan or a plan and working those things in a top-down way with unique resources available that has produced uh, in the time that I've been there, you know, um, an increase of 20 times in, in incomes. The movement of, it used to be the below poverty level, it's 88% of the population was below poverty level. Today it's less than 1%. There is an ability uh, to produce productivity, but it's a very it's a culture clash with the West, because in some ways, because there, as, as one of the leaders described it to me, the United States is a country of individualists, and individual is working that up. China is more of a, a country of that is an extension of the model of the family. They he described. He said, "There's um, the word." Uh, country in China represents state family. And if you go back to Confucianism and how it is run top down, and that is where there's an element of a culture clash. At the same time, when you look at that productivity and the, and, and the policies and things, it's a very effective uh, place. So I would say it's important to distinguish the short-term influences from the longer-term productivity influences and then recognize that we're now in a world where there is a competition, and that can mean conflict in different dimensions between the two countries. That means, um, I think the trade issue is a manageable issue. I think the way of being issue is a challenging issue, because you can't expect, Americans can't expect, Chinese to operate in a way um, that is different from that, or vice versa. So I think that's, that's the bigger, longer-term issue. But I think you'd have to be very, um, optimistic um, when, when you think of a, a, even a 5 or 6 percent growth rate and what that's going to mean and what the world will look like in 10 or 20 years, it'll be quite a different world in which China is going to be, I think, a lot stronger. So I think that's the picture. Not, let's not confuse the short term with that bigger picture, evolutionary picture. But what about the picture of debt? I mean, how worried should we be about debt, particularly, I mean, the U.S. has to sell debt. China, obviously one of the biggest, most significant holders of the U.S.'s debt. Are any of these issues, Dr. Fang, in terms of the trade spat, in terms of slowing growth in China, are they impacting capital flows? Um, you know, China will continue to be uh, a, what we call a saving surplus country for some time, uh, although the saving is kind of decli uh, declining. Uh, but it will be a saving uh, surplus country. So we have to invest abroad. And uh, um, you know, the US government bond market um, turns out to be a good place to invest. So I, I don't think China will uh, you know, in any way significantly reduce its investment into the US uh, government bond market. Uh, but on the other hand, um, in terms of capital flow, uh, you know, we, we, we do open up. We want more companies you know, from different sectors uh, to come into China. Uh, so that should increase capital inflows. Uh, uh, we want to increase you know, both ways. Uh, and I want to, uh, Maria, I want to you know, add one point to what uh, Ray Dalio just said about the cultural shock. Right? Um, China does have sort of a different approach to uh, economic uh, management. And uh, uh, I think in this world, uh, perhaps we should you know, learn from each other a little bit. And I want to give you just one example about how we manage our financial risk. Uh, over the last 40 years, you know, China hasn't had a very significant financial crisis, for example. And that's very rare among the developing world. 
And I used to work for the World Bank, and you know, we have financial crisis in the developing countries a lot. Uh, and how China has been able to avoid financial crisis right, in the last 40 years? Well, we have a very um, kind of top-down uh, uh, approach to financial risk management, and that is the central government constantly is in touch uh, with the financial sector, you know, gets information from the financial sector in a timely manner. And if there's any risk accumulating in the system, the government you know, will step in and, and order the risk to be reduced. Now, of course, sometimes we will still miss something, right? So occasionally we have certain financial jitteries in the market. But once we have that financial jittery, you know, our system is able to react to these jitteries in a very quick way. And we move quickly to contain the risk so that the risk does not spread into the entire system and it does not create panic in the system. And then as the economy grows, right, the risk you know, is diluted going forward. So that's how we have been able to grow our economy by so much uh, and grow the financial system by so much without you know, incurring a major financial risk. So there's some lesson there, I think, uh, that you know, the rest of the world perhaps should uh, take a look at. I think there's, if I may, there's also a point of no return in this whole thing uh, about opening up for China, because you have to look at China's weight in the global economy has really increased massively. Mm -hmm. China is bordering onto you know, at least 20% uh, weight in the global economy. If you look at exports, uh, if you look at global growth, still today, most of the growth that we see globally is generated by China's inclusion into the world economy. Now, that is reflected by now putting China a lot more into portfolios, because you can't just have a big part of the global economy be Chinese, and investors completely have zero exposure to that growth in their portfolio. So China gets inclusions into uh, indices like the MSCI in the equity indices or in the bond indices like the Bloomberg Index. Our estimate is over the next quarters, there will be 250 billion of capital inflows into China, basically just by this 4% weight that China will get. Now, so far, Ray's absolutely right. China debt is not a problem because it's largely domestically held. Domestic policies and redistribution of that debt can easily be engineered by policymakers. International investors, if they invest in China debt or equity, they want different standards. They want accounting standards. They want very clear, solid products to invest in. So what is happening is that will raise the standards and the bars for equity markets in China because you need to bring international investors in and you also need to allow, because you just don't want a big inflow into the Chinese economy that puts upward pressure on the exchange rate, you need to open up in sync international investments for your citizens to invest in the rest of the world so you create capital outflows. So in the future, the whole debate about QFI and QDI quotas will be a lot more interlinked because you know, large banks like us who compete at the top level for Chinese clients will have to do both. Only if our action is not just one-sided by bringing international capital in, but also having Chinese invest abroad, we will not have an impact in what we do on you know, policy preferences, like you know, no impact on the exchange rate. So I think there is a point of no return where you simply, once you open up, you get included in these index, you get drawn into the global economy, and that's where I think you really need to do these supply side reforms to do that in a more resilient manner. So I'm not worried about the sort of credit cycle in, in China at the moment, because the Chinese central bank can really create a lot more monetary stimulus without even touching interest rates. Reserve requirements are at you know 23%, I think is the last number I saw. You can massively re reduce reserve requirements for domestic banks and create credit origination without really doing anything through the interest rate channel yeah, alone. On this point of no return of opening up, uh, well, the main reason is that opening up is is good for China. Sure. You know, you mentioned the, the Asia inclusion into the MSCI index, and the effect that that inclusion is already felt in the Chinese market in terms of raising the quality of the market, because we now have to respond to the demand of the international institution the investors. Mm -hmm. So just to give you a very concrete example. In the Shanghai Stock Exchange, we used to calculate you know, the, the closing price mm -hmm. of a stock by its last trade. And that's not very good you know, uh, for uh, international investors. Now, we, according to their uh, request, we have to change that into 
the uh, uh, average price of the last three minutes in a uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, concentrated trading manner. Uh, and now it's much better uh, according to the international investors. So this is just a very you know, small example of how opening up has been good for China, and we will continue to do that. I, I would like to push back on a little bit of this point. Um, if we look back, you know, maybe 200 years back, this century's financial history might well be written by China. Now, it's not just a question of whether China is ready or not for opening up, and here we're talking not just about opening up to trade, but opening up capital accounts and exchange rate flexibility. The question is, is the world ready? Let us be reminded that China is still a developing country with a financial system with a whole array of issues. Because of the weight it, is, it has in the economy, because even so far it hasn't ap opened up you know, the financial linkages, but when it does, all of its volatility in China will transmit to the world in much greater proportions than we've seen. 2015, 2017, these were small movements in China and they sent jitters to the financial markets. Now imagine a really open Chinese market. The point behind this is, should China not consider domestic financial reforms, sort its domestic issues first before thinking about really wide-scale opening up, in which case the financial linkages would be much stronger. So the world also needs to understand that the second largest economy in the world and the ones that's going to be transmitting the volatility is still a developing country. That's, that's the first point. The second is we've talked about how you know, most of us agree that the debt problems in China are within uh, you know, management. I would agree, I would say definitely the same, but it's really about how this debt is used and how, you know, how this credit is used. In, since 2009, the 40 trillion, 4 trillion RMB fiscal stimulus has led to a gross misallocation of resources. So it's not so much about the level of debt, the amount of credit in the economy, but where it is going. Is it just going to big SOEs, low productivity firms, infrastructure pro, pro, uh, pro, uh, you know, projects, or is this credit channeled to productive parts of the sector? Now, if the misallocation of resources can be reduced, then there is enormous potential for China to continue uh, to grow. <laughs> Lastly, um, I want to point to two facts that we've recently seen. For the first time in decades, in the first half of uh, 2018, China is now importing more from the world than it's exporting. It's running a current account deficit. That has huge implications. Now, the two gentlemen on my left have talked about low interest rate, about you know, challenges to monetary policy, both in Europe and the US. China will source as, serve as a main source of aggregate demand, where aggregate demand, as we have seen, is very lacking in the rest of the world. Inflation has not come up. Interest rates are still at record low levels. China will potentially be an important source of aggregate demand going forward now that it's importing more. So pushing for a divorce with China is not necessarily a good idea. I, 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 I just want, oh, sorry. I think Ke, you reminded uh, me you know, as a regulator of our responsibilities, right? Because as China draws more capital into its financial market, the jetways inside China can have a huge impact in the international world. And uh, uh, we have to raise our capabilities to do a better job. <laughs> uh, I think we also have to look at what's happening in the light of the rises and declines of reserve currencies in the world and the normal patterns. And if you, if you look at it from the Dutch guilder, the um, <coughs> British pound, uh, and the US dollar, and now China, and, w and how countries evolve, and you look at those patterns over a series of history, history um, we know that, first of all, technology is the leading uh, reason for the developments. We know that uh, each of those countries has to go global with their currency and their banks. We know that uh, they have to be um, develop their financial markets. Every one of those has had um, a financial center. Amsterdam was, London was, New York was, and now in, in China they must have their financial markets. We know that that opening up helps their balance of payments and it also helps the development of um, 
the development of the renminbi as a reserve currency, the going global of China. Um, that will happen. That's an inevitable part of the development. Simultaneously, though, we have to look at the United States, and we have to think um, of its implications. There is a cycle that this happens. The rises of these reserve currencies happen because the company, countries become more competitive, technologies and all of those things, balance of payments, and they go global. The declines of world, world reserve currencies happen quite often because they have reserve currencies. There's a lot of lending to them. And in the United States, we have to talk about the United States and the United States debt, a government debt. The, we're talking a lot about China. But, and but, and that, that's part of that puzzle, a big part of that puzzle. But we also have uh, a real problem in terms of the quantity of debt that we're going to have to sell to the rest of the world over the next few years. We've experienced a lot of stimulation because of a combination of the tax cuts and the stimulation. Where if you do the projections, the pro forma projections, and think who's going to buy that amount of debt and the amount of debt that we have to sell, I think that that's going to be an issue. So when we're talking about the balance, I think the normal evolution will be globalization, in which I would characterize China as basically um, um, allowing a, a very free markets in many ways within boundaries, and then not to let it go outside of that boundary of volatility. So if I was to take a foreign mm -hmm. exchange policy, mm -hmm. You will have more freedom, but you'll have boundaries, so it can't go beyond those boundaries, which I think is a good thing. Mm -hmm. And then, but you're going to have that globalization, you're going to have the development of the currency, and there is a, a, a problem or a challenge in terms of debt, in ter which relates to the currency issue, because a, a bond is a promise to deliver a lot of currency. It's just basically a pile of currency spread over a period of time. And I would say that if you were to take a longer term perspective, two or three or four years, that that's going to be an issue. And so I do think that capital flows and the nature of uh, that balance of payments issue is going to be a, a factor in the years ahead. You want to mm -hmm. comment on that, Dr. Fang, before we move on? I want to get the questions from the audience, and I do want to turn back to Europe. But first, can you respond to what, what Ray just presented? Yeah, uh, you know, essentially what Ray said is that you know, the Chinese economy is so large, so whatever happens in China you know, has a lot of impact uh, on the world. And uh, as we draw capital in, there will be capital uh, flowing out. Uh, I think one of the lessons that you know, China learned over the last few years is that uh, we know that we, we are a large economy, so our impact on the rest of the world is something that we have to take into account when we make policies. So we want to make sure that you know, the policy changes in China, uh, as well as the economic variable changes in China, uh, is not uh, uh, so large. You know, uh, uh, because if it's very big or it's kind of very steep, uh, it's going to have a very big impact on the, on the rest of the world. And we, we understand that. Dr. Fang, let me, let me ask you, before we mm. close the loop on this subject, obviously opening up the markets in China appears to be a priority for the yes. Chinese leadership to, yes. to the rest of the world. Yes. How much of a priority is the forced transfer of technology and IP theft? Um, I'm not an expert in this area. <laughs> uh, um, you know, we, we are against forced uh, technology transfer and uh, IP theft, of course, is not something that we uh, would like to see. Uh, I think we can sit down and talk about these things. Would that be something as far, to, as far as part of a deal with the United States that you would try to make progress on those issues? You know, we are willing to talk to the United States on every issue that the U.S. <laughs> raises. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, our overall objective is to have you know, a uh, cooperative relations uh, in economics as well as in other areas with the United States. This is such a rich topic. We can continue talking about it, but I want to hear from all of you because we have such an informed and experienced group in the audience. Yes, sir, right here. Please say who you are. And by the way, this is being live streamed on TopLink, World Economic Forum, as well as on Fox Business. Uh, you should know that. I wanted to say that from the beginning. Please, sir, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, my name is Anthony Hobley. I'm the CEO of the Carbon Tracker Initiative. I guess we're mission-driven, philanthropically funded investment bank analysts. Um, the title of this session is Rethinking Global financial risk. In the WEF survey that just came out of global risks, I think three or four out of the top five 
is climate change. Um, so why, haven't, why hasn't the C word or the double C word even come up in this conversation? Um, is, is this what Mark Carney said, it's the tragedy of the horizon, so Mark Carney, the governor of the Bank of England. We've just had last week, I think, PGNL, the U California utility company, putting itself into chapter 11 to protect itself from the liabilities from the wildfires which have been exacerbated by climate change. So I guess my question to the panel is when you're talking about rethinking global financial risk and the, the community that makes up WEF thinks that's one of the biggest issues or three or four of the biggest issues in the world, why haven't you even raised that as part of this conversation? I, I think that I think there are a number of issues that we haven't raised that, you know, the limited amount of time and there's a flow. <laughs> but I mean, uh, glo of course, that's going to be a big business issue. At, I, I think that's correct. We didn't deal with um, the, the wealth gap or, and we didn't deal with uh, technologies and we didn't deal with artificial intelligence and we didn't deal with a whole laundry list of important things, uh, limited amount of time. And I guess we... Uh, became more focused on China, but it's an important issue. And, and we will touch as well on, on Brexit, because this is another uncertainty in Europe. How much of an issue are, are the, the issues in Europe as uh, impacting the rest of the world? Very quickly. Well, I think it, it's an unfolding story. And, uh, you know, last year I remember when, when everyone sort of felt that the sky was the limit and there was a, a huge sort of common uh, belief that things could only get better. Uh, this year, I think the mood is a bit too gloomy. I, I, I still have firm beliefs that policymakers are elected to provide solutions. Uh, sometimes it's a winding road. Sometimes there are setbacks. So this has been a pretty volatile, evolving situation. I think ultimately, uh, it is not in anybody's interest to have an unorderly Brexit without new rules of the game being defined. If that requires because they started late and they didn't gain traction and they didn't agree early, if that requires more time to negotiate, that's the rational thing to do. I think creating domestic acceptance for a deal you're about to sign is as important as having the other side agree to that deal with you. And so I think the Commission and everyone should give themselves the time in order to mitigate what is a tail risk for Europe. I don't see the calendar and basically triggering exit without really having the solution as a wise strategy. I didn't think it, had, it was a wise strategy at the time. I think we're starting to see that the clock is running out and the obvious thing for me to do when that is the case and you're not done is you should stop the clock and stop, ne uh, stop negotiations only then when you got a deal. I think a unorderly Brexit in, in nobody's interest and I take some reassurance by the fact that the British Parliament is more deeply involved now in these discussions because ultimately the Parliament has made clear that uh, we want to move to a new stage but we want to do that in an orderly way and not doing it without a deal is not something that is the preference of so, many. So you, you think Britain leaves the European Union but they will not do it in a hard way, they will do it with a well thought out trade situation with, with partners? I've been in so many financial rescues 10 years ago. Uh, it always looked a very difficult situation at 1 o'clock at night. Mm. By 2 o'clock, when the Japanese markets opened, we needed a solution. Usually that last hour was where most of the things moved. So mm. I'm still, you know, we're, okay, we're okay. still sort of almost 60 days away uh, from, from that March end date. And I think there will be some own dynamics in this. In the end, I think people have to start making compromises. Uh, this is, you know, it's okay to insist on your position if you're negotiating, but in the end, if you want a deal, everyone needs to compromise. I haven't seen the compromises on the table Let's, so let's get as many questions as we can in. Go ahead, sir. Just very quickly, my name is Marcos Brujis. I'm the chief executive of the IFC Asset Management Company, International Finance Corporation. Uh, one thing that we've seen in China is that reserves have gone down from around $4 billion in 2014, $4 trillion, to $4 trillion 2014, 2015. They are now below three. So it's, uh, uh, it, I mean, it's more, more than a trillion has been spent. A lot of that, this money has been spent through some of these uh, sovereign and quasi-sovereign wealth funds, uh, SAFE, CIC, uh, the money that went into AIIB, and a lot of this money has gone to very risky markets. Okay, I'm originally from Latin America, so I've been worried when I've seen some of that money going to Venezuela, which, uh, if you ask me, it's going to be hard to collect, let's put it uh, <laughs> uh, mildly. Uh, yeah. My question to the panel is, the, if as a result of these 
very aggressive investments in very difficult markets in Africa, in uh, South Asia, uh, that not all of them will go great if uh, uh, you will see that China will all of a sudden beca uh, begin uh, borrowing a little bit in the United States style in order to continue funding, for example, its Belt and Road Initiative. Comments? Well, uh, uh, I think three trillion, we are still, still slightly above three trillion, um, and three trillion is perhaps more than enough, right? as foreign currency reserve. Now, of course, we can always make better use of the foreign currency reserve that we have. And you pointed out, you know, uh, Venezuela, all these countries, um, whether China is using its foreign currency reserve wisely or not. Um, well, it, it remains to be seen, right? Uh, we still need some more time. Uh, but we can always make Im improvement uh, in, in, in these aspects. 15 years ago, people were complaining that China was uh, you know, purchasing US treasuries and losing money. And they had to go for higher return, more diversified assets. And you're seeing the consequence of that. Yes, sir. My name is Gilberto Marina. I'm the president of Alquimara. I would like to, to hear some comments about uh, if, there, if you see some risk in Latin America, especially in Brazil and Mexico. Great question. And we will hear from the new president of Brazil at the World Economic Forum today at 3.30. Comments about Latin America? Uh, I, I, I think that um, the, the cycle in Brazil has been a good cycle in terms of the uh, changes. Um, in, terrible balance payments, it became expensive. It was bank subsidies by the government, a number of things that created a classic balance payments crisis, classic debt crisis, in which then the exchange rate became very cheap and you had then the funding and it became somewhat attractive to invest in. And now we're dealing with the political questions that will come out of that. So um, I would say, um, by and large, it's on a good track, but there are questions in terms of pension reforms, political reforms, corruption issues. All of those enter into a picture uh, uh, of what Brazil will look like coming forward. So uh, I would say on a good track, but there's a lot to be seen. And, and we'll see what Mr. Bolsonaro says today uh, from here in Davos. Yes, sir. Jacob. Thank you. I'm Jacob Frankel, uh, Chairman JP Morgan Chase International. First of all, it was a fantastic panel. Um, it was taken for granted that the US is ahead of the game in terms of uh, recovery. But I want to make sure that we recognize that it's not just a cycle and we just need to wait and everything else will happen. It was the results of policies. There is a consensus. The reason why the US performance has been so uh, positive, it reflects the corporate tax reform, it reflects policies concerning the trapped capital, it reflects the deregulation, it reflects the attitudes toward business, and the like. So it's not a political statement, but it's a statement that says, you want to see results, you better do some policies, and it is the corporate sector that does the growth, therefore it needs to be not uh, be the enemy, but the partner. Having said all of this, and given that there are so many other sessions, still, there is one overwhelming subject of risk that we do not have a good systemic answer to, and it has to do with the cyber. We do not have the international agreements about it and the like, and that's something that all of us are really losing sleep about. Thank you so much, Jacob. As we wrap up, let me just reiterate some of the points that were made on this panel. It does appear that we are in a slowing economic environment, uh, although Dr. Fang mentions that 6% growth is still quite attractive. And uh, also, uh, KU made the point that China will ultimately be the solution for the world in terms of demand and the place uh, that we will see many imports coming in. China is now importing more last year than it actually exported. Ray Dalio made a very important point in terms of capital flows and, and, and what your expectation is in terms of as this deleveraging goes on in China, what the impact will be on the dollar. It sounds like you will have concerns there. You made the point on Brexit and the point on uh, the European situation uh, is what? That you believe Brexit will take place, but you do believe 
calmer heads will prevail and it will not be a hard exit. At least I hope so, uh, you know, uh, you never know, I mean, but uh, I think it would be completely irrational to let this situation get out of hand. Uh, Europe has been challenged over the last decade with homemade problems. If you look at France, if you look at Germany, there are major uh, leadership issues in, in all of our countries and adding Brexit as a uncontrollable risk to that mix would just set Europe back for, you know, years to come. So I think it is nobody's interest to really, ha you know, do a hasty exit. Uh, without an organized deal. So yes, I, I hope and I believe that policymakers will have second thoughts. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you to our esteemed panel. Have a good day. Mm -hmm.